This is Life Point Church. We sure hope that you're staying healthy and safe. And feel free to sing along with us today as we worship the Lord.
feel like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail on to find me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail on to find me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh. Choices that you make, cause they're the choices that made me. 
Even though I love this crazy life Sometimes I wish it was a smoother ride Dear younger me Dear younger me I knew then what I know now Condemnation would have had no power My joy, my pain would never have been my worth If I knew then what I knew now Would have not been hard to figure out What I would have changed If I had heard Dear younger me It's not your fault you were never meant to carry this beyond the cross, Lord. Do you me? You are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed. Set apart a brand new heart, oh, you are free indeed. In every mountain, every valley, through each heart and you will see. Every moment brings you closer to who you're meant to be, dear younger me, dear younger me. You are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed. Set apart, brand new heart, oh you are free indeed. You are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed. Set apart, brand new heart. Oh, you are free indeed. You are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed. Set apart, brand new heart. Oh, you are free indeed. Good job, Lauren. Okay, I got it. Okay, don't forget to carry the one. Okay, that was delicious, thank you. Hold on there, kiddo. Dad. Say cheese. Cheese. There you go. Okay, just one more. Hold your trophy up a little bit higher. Dad. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Mm. Dad. Love it. Um, no. Dad. Dad. And they were here first. So Dad. We... So you want to go catch a movie at like 7.30 or something? <sighs> Dad. And one more. Okay, one more. Okay, let's go. Wait, wait, wait. Come on. Just one more. One more. Dad. I'm so proud of you. Now you just gotta get a job. Dad! You look beautiful. Oh, Dad. Uh, and stand just a little closer together and move just a little bit to the left, uh, my left, uh, a little more. Dad! Happy Father's Day. I love being a father, but man, what a trip that is. I hope you're, I hope you're enjoying it too. I know it's quite a challenge. We want to thank you for being a father and all that that means and all that you do. This week, because it's Father's Day, I was, as I was walking around, I asked a couple of guys that were standing together that I knew, hey, tell me what I should tell fathers this Sunday. Silence. Crickets. They, didn't, they just looked like, well, the proverbial deer in the headlights. So I just waved them out. They didn't say anything, so I decided I was going to wait them out. 
I just going to sit there until they said something. Finally, the older of the two said, I don't really know what to say. I'd have to think about that. So I wanted to try to make it easier for them. So I said this. I said, well, don't try to think of the perfect thing. Just tell me something, something that you would share with fathers. Then the younger one said, I've, I'm trying to learn from my father's bad example. Well, he had our attention as soon as he said that. We were looking at him, and once again, we didn't say anything. And he went on to say that his father was in prison. He said his, his father got out one time when he was in elementary school, and he met him then. His father went back to prison, got out once when he was in middle school, and he met him again. And his father is still in prison. He said, I'm learning from my father's bad example. I'm trying to spend a lot of time with my son. As it turns out, his son was right there with him. He had a young son that he had taken to work with him. Now, the older gentleman, and I had known this guy for a while. I know him because he comes to the church to do some work here. The older guy knows him because he works with him. Neither one of us knew that his father had been in prison all his life. What fathers do makes a difference and makes an impact. After he started speaking like that, the older guy said, well, I, had a, I really had a good father. And he said, I think I've been a good father. And my kids have turned out well. So I think my father helped me be a good father. So the question I want to ask you is, what would you tell fathers? What advice or what encouragement would you give to fathers? It's not easy doing this. I mean, it's, it's a serious challenge. It's just, well, let's be honest. Sometimes I'm a good father. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I miss it. And so do you. If we were to try to think of, you know, really great examples of people that are fathers, and I were to say, hey, name fathers in the Bible that did a great job. I think you're going to struggle because a lot of the fathers in the Bible, well, they struggled as well. Now, the one that you're probably going to think of is, uh, well, you know, Joseph, the, father, the, father, the earthly father of Jesus. Now, the truth is, is we don't know much about him. We know that he was, so, he was incredible enough that God trusted him with an awesome task of raising the baby Jesus along with Mary. He must have done something right to, to get that assignment. But we really don't know much about him other than the fact that when Jesus was 12, he was taken to Jerusalem to one of the Passover feasts, and apparently when he was a baby, he was dedicated in the temple. So we know he obviously did some things right, but we really don't know everything about him. So I can't give you a, a lots of great examples, but I'm just going to make the assumption he was a really good father. But guess what? Even though he had messages from God, and so did Mary, they were involved in the most miraculous thing that has ever occurred. When their real children, in other words, their biological children that they had together grew up, they didn't think Jesus was who he said he was. So obviously as parents, they struggled to get that across to his brothers. They didn't become believers in Jesus until after he had been crucified and they saw him resurrected. But hey, if you saw a resurrected Jesus, you, I think that would do it for you too. It did it for them. And they became serious followers. In fact, you can read what they have to say by reading in the book of, of James in the Bible and the book of Jude. It's amazing. But they struggled. In fact, you, you may struggle. Now, as you start thinking about other fathers in the Bible, you think about Noah. He had incredible faith. He did something that was just remarkable. He exercised a faith that just was staggering. But then, after surviving what God called him to do, he got drunk, and then, well, I don't even want to tell you what he did after that. It's, uh, it's bad. He messed up. Who else can you think about? Well, Abraham. 
he was, what incredible faith he had in obedience. God told him to leave the country that he was living in and go to a, a new land, and he didn't even tell him where he was going. So he was to leave where he, where he was at, follow God to this new country. He said, when you get there, I'll let you know you're there. Well, he gets there, and God says, I'm not even going to let you have this land. It's going to go to your descendants like 400 years from now. 400 years? Seriously? Yes, seriously. I'm, but I'm going to make you a, 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 a mighty nation. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. In other words, you're going to have lots and lots of descendants. He didn't even have a child at that point. God let him wait, and he got a little impatient with God. He, got, well, he figured, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but I guess i got to do something. So he took another woman and had a child through her. Oops. Bad plan, his plan. He messed up. He wasn't perfect. He did some incredible things, but yet he did some incredible mess-ups too. When you look at his son, Isaac, well, he showed favoritism toward his two sons, Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob showed favoritism toward one of his 12 sons, Joseph. So much so that 10 of his brothers wanted to kill him. Only one brother talked them out of killing him. They ended up selling him as a slave into Egypt. And you think about King Saul and how he messed up. And King David, well, King David messed up. In a, well, how can you mess up worse than this? He committed adultery and then he, had, he arranged it so that her husband would be killed in battle. The point is this. There are no perfect men in the Bible. There are no perfect fathers. I'm not a perfect father, and you're not a perfect father. We all need saviors. We all need forgiveness. We all need guidance. And so, well, let's get it. Let's look at Scripture and see what it tells us about how we should be a father to our children. We read this in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, it says this, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to the commands that I'm giving you today. Well, it starts there. You start with a commitment, a commitment. I, I'm all in. I'm, oh, I'm not kind of sorry to end. I'm all in. There, well, is there a God or no? If there's a God, then let's be all out in terms of following him and his scripture and what he's revealed to us. If there isn't, well, then I guess we can ignore the whole thing. But God says, commit yourself wholeheartedly to the commands. Now, commands, that's not something we like. We don't like to be told what to do. But this is God telling us, hey, this is the best way to live. You want to know how to live well? Do this. Make the commitment to follow what I'm teaching you today. This was God speaking through Moses to the people then, and we get to read it now. And so what did he say? He said, repeat. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road when you're going to bed, and you're getting up. In other words, repeat. If I tell my children something one time, did they get it? No way. It has to be something that they hear over and over again. They need to realize it's not just a one and done. This is really going to be the way it is. And so when you repeat things, you reinforce it, and when you reinforce it, it has a chance of sticking and being part of who they are and who you are. So this repeating thing is, is, is critical. It's a daily thing. It's a monthly thing. It's a yearly thing. It's something that you never let go. And so, okay, as you're repeating, what are you repeating? Well, where do you, how do you do this? Well, talk about them when you're at home. Talk about what God teaches on how to live when you're at home. Well, that makes sense because you're at home with your kids. You can plan things out. You can think, you know, what do I need to teach my kids how should I go about it? What kind of things do I want to get across to them? What kind of values? What's important? What's important to me? What's important to God? You make that decision. You make that plan. And so obviously you could just wander through life. You could, well, I just get up every day and see what happens and kind of react to it as it happens. You could do that. That's not a good way of doing it. Better idea is to do what this says, which is to commit yourself to God and his commands, to live them out, and to repeat them to your children. Figure it out, plan it out, have opportunities to do that when you're at your home. For example, you could have, well, say a verse of scripture that you're going to share 
at supper and just one verse and why it's important to you and how it impacted your life. Or you could read something before they go to bed, something of that nature where in some fashion or another, you're making a decision to make this part of your home life. But not just when you're at home, but also when you're on the road. You're hustling down the road and somebody does something crazy in a car in front of you. That's not too rare here in Houston. So at that particular moment, you have the opportunity to teach them how to react in those moments. It's completely in your control. And then when they're going to bed. Now, that's an easy time when they're little. Well, the little ones love for you to read Bible stories to them. I, I can remember many times I'd be trying to read a Bible story. I'm tired. I'm trying to get them in bed, but I want to get the Bible story in. And after they hear one, they want to hear another one. Or they want to hear the same one again because they're young. It's really easy to do this when they're young. They love it. Harder when they're old, obviously. That's where a, a verse that's scripture that's not, you know, well, it's important to you. It's succinct. And you're sharing how it impacts you and how you, well, how you try to live it out, even how you struggle to live it out. And then when you're getting up, when you get up in the morning, is there this attitude that you communicate to your family, hey, you know what? I don't know what I have in store for today. I know that God has a plan. He may have some divine appointments for me. I, I don't know what's coming, but I know this. Whatever God wants me to do, that's what I want to do. I want to be in on whatever he has. And so if you communicate that you're up and at them and ready to go and ready to follow uh, Jesus wherever he leads you, That'll come across to your, to your family. Then it says to tie these commands to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. That seems weird. Well, it is weird. In, in our culture, you're not going to do that. You're not going to tie anything to your hands. What they're trying to say is you have these things just as part of your life. You carry them everywhere you go. It says to write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, let me tell you how I do it. You walk into our house in the hallway on the left, you walk in, there's a little picture. It says, as for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. Another place in the house, there's a place where Patty has done a cross stitch uh, of the Psalm 23. Now, we don't have a lot of it around the house, but we do have uh, a Bible laying out that doesn't have a lot of dust on it. Good, huh? And we have a couple of Christian books, and we have those things. These are visual reminders that... These things are important to us in our household. So you can do that in some fashion that fits you and your, and your family. So we have to make decisions. What are we going to do? This is one of the prescriptions that God gives us for how we can go about doing this. Now, this well, all back about two weeks ago. Some kids were playing basketball at the church, and they were having a good time. And as I walked out there, I said hi to them. And I looked around, and I saw, well, there was Taco Bell stuff laying around, bags and plastic bottles from drinks and that sort of thing. And so I told them, hey, here's what my dad used to tell me. He used to tell me to leave a place better than you found it. So when you guys get finished, I'd appreciate you cleaning up and even picking up some things that you didn't actually do yourself. Now... Do you think those guys stopped right that moment, got their pens out or the phones out, and wrote that down and memorized it? No way. They didn't do that. But it is, it's like a first impression that I have on them to say that, you know, hey, it's important to think about the impact that you're leaving. To leave a place in better shape than you found it. Now, if I have more opportunities, and I will, because I see these guys ever so often, I'll have opportunities to reinforce that and help them to maybe see that that's an important thing to do. Here's why it's important to me. When I was growing up, my dad was an air traffic controller. To get the opportunity for a promotion, we ended up having to move from city to city, from, from you know, small airports to bigger airports to ever bigger airports to be promoted. Well, when we left Little Rock, Arkansas to move to San Antonio, Texas, I saw my dad working on the house and, and dealing with, well, minutiae, really, little small things that made the house better. And even as a little guy, I looked at it and I said, hey, Dad, why are you doing that? And in the middle of that, without even stopping, he just said, son, always leave a place better than you found it. It, it kind of stuck with me because I noticed that that's exactly what he was doing. 
When we went camping, we left the campsite better than we found it, cleaner than we found it. I could give you many other examples, but the truth is he, that was a value that he expressed to me and that he actually lived out, and so I picked it up as well. In fact, when I just simply go for a walk in the neighborhood around the house, if I see some trash or nails or whatever on the, on the street, I pick it up as I go. And my thought is, I'm leaving it better than I found it. You see, those kind of little spontaneous moments are opportunities to teach. When you're on the road, spontaneous type things can happen. They're not planned. They're just you teaching in the moment. But there were plenty of times when it was planned out. For example, my father had the plan that we're going to go to church every Sunday unless we're sick. There was never a point of discussion, should we go to church this week? It was never even brought up. If we were healthy, everybody knew we're going to go to church. It was just a given. I would encourage you to think in those the same way too. As you're, as you're doing these kinds of things, what you're trying to do is not simply get across information. You're not simply trying to get across the facts that you find in the Bible. You're trying to communicate heart to heart with your kids. You want them to know why you feel that way. You want them to feel that way. You want to, you want to, con, you want to communicate those facts, but you, it's more important that you communicate wisdom. And wisdom is when you know facts and you can apply it to your life situation. When you know how to use the, the truth of Scripture in a way that impacts your life in a positive way. Wisdom is using knowledge in the right way. So I had those planned moments that my dad worked into my life, and I had planned moments with my kids where I made the decision that this is what I want to teach them, and so I had to think about how I was going to go about it. But then I also had those spontaneous things that happened, those teachable moments where I could get points across, just like my father did to me. And sometimes I would use my father's example. I would tell them the story I told you to get the point across to them. Even today, I, I really enjoy going to Starbucks with my sons and just sitting there and talking. We'll just sit and we'll talk and we'll share with each other about what's important and why it's important. And they will have a tendency in that format to tell me things they won't tell me anywhere else. I don't know what's going to work for you and your family, but I would encourage you to to think about it, to have a plan. What are you going to do? Here's what the church wants to do. As a church, we want to help you. We want to provide things to help you succeed as a parent. When your kids are able to meet here at the building, our goal is to, help, is to assist you in helping your children come to a point where they trust Jesus for forgiveness and give him leadership of their life, and they learn how to live in a way that honors God and, and is a benefit to society. And I know that's what you'd want too. Even now when we can't meet together in person, we have all these resources on the website, the, the videos and the downloadable activities that go along with the videos. And we stand ready to help you. If you say, I don't really know how to use it, well, just call. We'd love to help you. We have tremendous resources that we want to make available to you to help you with your kids. We want to help you succeed as a parent. Now, sometimes, as a parent, we struggle. Patty and I sometimes would have things happen to us, and we'd be tempted to react in a negative way. And we'd see it kind of coming on in ourselves or, or each other. And we would make this statement, class is in session. Now, when the kids were small, we'd just say class is in session. What we meant by that was, these kids are going to learn from how we respond to this difficult moment. And so it helped us to kind of bring our emotions under control and to think through how we were going to respond because the way we respond was going to teach these kids how to respond. They need those kind of moments. They need to see you struggle. They even need to see you fail sometimes and admit that you failed. 
and see how you deal with failure. To see that you will apologize and admit that you're wrong when you're wrong. We're not going to get it right all the time. My dad didn't get it right all the time. He was a great father. I miss him a lot. You know what I would really like more from my father than, even though as good a father as he was, what I wish I had even more was even more time with him and could have more conversation with him. I don't want, at, at no point in my life, except when I was like, I don't know, what, 15 to 19, that I want less conversation from him. During those uh, moments of insanity called the later teenage years, I guess I struggled a little bit with that as many teenagers do, but I always valued my father's input and I knew his love for me, and his commitment to me. I really, I really, even at this moment, would love to be able to talk to him some more, asking questions. I had the song sung just before the message, Dear Younger Me, for a reason. If I were to give advice to a younger me about being a father, I would say this. I would say I wish I was even more open than I was in terms of the, my own particular struggles. And I did have struggles. I remember one time when my youngest son was struggling with me because he thought I was being too easy on his older brother. And he, he was so upset with me that he said this to me. He said, Dad, I used to think there was no better man than you, but I don't think that anymore. Now, that was a, quite a statement. He said it in, a, in just a respectful way. He was saying how he felt. And I wasn't upset with him for saying that because I, I want the kind of openness that we can have a conversation of that nature. And what I told him was, son, I'm not going to get it right all the time. But here's what I can tell you. I am really trying to get it right. I'm doing the best that I can. And I hope that you are a better father than I am. But you can't count on me always being right. But here's something you can count on. I'm going to do the best I can. And so I would, have, I would encourage even more openness than that to my younger self. I would encourage more tough conversations about the kind of temptations that they were going to face. I wish I had talked about every temptation that they were going to face before they faced it. I didn't cover them all, and I wish I had. I think it would be best if they heard it, a frank discussion with me about the temptations that were inevitable that were going to come. And I would encourage you to have the boldness to go there, too. We had a lot of really wonderful conversations, and I think we did well. But it wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. I'm still not perfect. I still make mistakes. But I'm still trying to do the best I can. As you face all this, you have, you have so many things to deal with. You have a career, and you're trying to do the best you can. You want to succeed in your career. Your career. You're married. You're trying to have a, a great marriage. You've got your kids, and you're trying to be a great father. And you're, you're coming to church. You're listening to this. You're, you're a follower of Jesus, and you want to have a close relationship with Jesus. So here you are. You're trying to think, how do I do all this stuff? How can I possibly get, you know, it, it, sometimes it seems like it's just too much. How can I get it all done? There's not enough time, and there's not enough of you. It seems like you're spread too thin. What you simply have to do is realize that, that God loves you. He's for you. He's working to help you. He's doing everything he possibly can to help you. And he wants to help you in your career. He wants to help you in your job. He wants you to be the best employee you can possibly be. At the same time, he wants you to have a good work-home balance. He, because he wants your marriage to succeed. He wants you to have a great marriage. He wants to help you in your marriage. He wants to help you with your kids. He wants to help you with your, his, your relationship with him. And so what are you going to do? Well, you get after it at work. You become a really great employee. You push it. You, you work good. You work hard. 
you try to do your best to learn and to become the best, most skilled person possible in your job. At the same time, you work on your marriage. You think, what can I do? Well, read a book. You say, well, I hadn't read a book since I was in school. Well, listen to an audible book. Those are good. I like it. A lot of people do. Or, or podcasts on, on marriage. Or listen to a vi watch a video on Right Now Media. We, our church pays for it, provides it for you free. These things are good. I mean, there's some really incredible videos there for you to watch. Here's the point. There's some way that you can do things to improve your marriage. Do it. You might need counseling. Go get it. Go to a marriage retreat. Do something. When it comes to kids, what can you do? Same thing. Read a book. I don't read a book. Okay, listen to a podcast. Listen to an audible book. Listen to right now media videos on, on raising kids and dealing with teenagers. Get a mentor. Do something. But make, it, make the point of having a plan to do something to improve as a parent. In terms of your relationship with Jesus, make a commitment. Commit yourself wholeheartedly. Get after it. Decide, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray every day. I'm going to read the Bible some. You don't, it doesn't have to be long, but you say, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to download that U version on my phone, and I'm going to follow one of the plans in there. Do something. Make a commitment to be part of church. And as you do these kinds of things, you'll, well, you'll grow in your relationship with Jesus, and it'll be good. I found that to really do well, you need a mentor. You need somebody that's ahead of you. And, and well, in all those areas, in work, marriage, children, in your relationship with following Jesus. Find somebody that's ahead of you and learn from them. Ask the questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. Get help. It'll make a huge difference. Not only should you get a mentor, but you should be a mentor. Find somebody that you can help. There's, there are people that you can help. And so I would encourage you to do that very, very thing. But decide. Make the decision. You know, t today, today, this is a new day. I'm starting over. This is the day I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to you know what? I'm going to up my game at work. I'm going to do things to improve my marriage. I'm going to improve my parenting skills. I'm going to increase my uh, relationship with Jesus by doing things that will help me have that very result. You can do it. You know, some of the best moments of my life have been times I spent with my father. And some of the best moments of my life have been those moments I spent with my sons. It's so worth it. A lot of guys and gals don't have a father in their life. Some of you need to reach out to those kids and be the father that they don't have. Here's the point. Being a father is important. Showing up in somebody's life is important. It's something that's going to be not only good for them, but it'll be good for you. I want to encourage you to make the decision that today is a new day. If you haven't done as well as a father, admit it. Admit it to God and admit it to your family. And then make this a new start. This can be a new day for you. And if you've been a great father, keep it up. Now go help somebody else who's struggling. Today, make that decision. God, I just thank you for fathers and the, and the influence that they have on us. I just pray that you'd encourage the fathers that are listening today. I pray that you'd help them to realize that being a father is incredibly important. It's hard, but you're going to help them. And I pray that you'd help them make the commitment to start fresh today with a fresh commitment to be the best father they can possibly be and to get the help that they need to be that father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.